So let me welcome you to the uh, second panel of, of this conference. Um, it, it's not so often uh, that I enter a foreign territory, such as a, a room full of lawyers, um, but, but it's a pleasure all the same uh, uh, to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Lane. I'm a member of the executive board here at the ECB, um, and I'm involved with, with monetary policy and economics uh, directorates of the ECB. So, so the, this panel, I think, has been uh, nicely designed uh, to talk about some uh, key, key uh, concepts and principles that, that we use quite a bit, but in the context uh, not of our primary mandate, but of the secondary mandate. So, so this panel is going to focus on the role of independence, accountability and proportionality in the context of the secondary mandate. Uh, so we, we have a very good panel. So beside me on, on the platform are Alexander Seal, who will speak in a minute, and, and Klaus Turi. Um, and we're joined online, or will be joined online, by Anne Cargan from the Bank of England. But before I, I hand over to, to the panelists, who each will make some opening remarks, uh, let me just briefly uh, give you uh, my own perspective from a monetary policy point of view. Because uh, this topic, I think, um, goes, goes through different phases, uh, is one way to think about it, or has different dimensions. Uh, and uh, two years ago, we, we had a monetary policy strategy review at the ECB, where the Governing Council, the National Central Banks, spent about a year with basically going from a blank piece of paper saying, OK, how should we organise monetary policy? Uh, and a lot goes in, went into that, including uh, this issue. And of course, uh, the, the kind of scope or, or the, what we mean by this uh, differs uh, over time and across different phases. So at that time, two years ago, uh, monetary policy had many instruments. We, we had an interest rate, but the interest rate was stuck at minus 0 0.5 uh, for, for our key deposit rate. We had an asset. We had several asset purchase programs. We had a targeted lending program to banks, and of course, if you have many instruments, that gives you optionality. You can say, well, to deliver price stability, um, I need some mix of those instruments. But maybe the mix of the, those instruments that, that I can execute can take into account secondary objectives. So, so, so the set of possibilities then was uh, very different to what we have now. Uh, which is basically monetary policy is, is uh, at one level in terms of active decision making, mostly boiled down now uh, to the interest rate decision. And of course, when you have one uh, main instrument, it's hard to think of multiple uh, dimensions when you have one instrument. That's not totally true because uh, we still have a very large balance sheet, which is shrinking. Uh, but while we still have that very large balance sheet, it, it does. Uh, uh, create room for balance sheet policies. Let me emphasize, however, uh, that even now, uh, let's imagine the balance sheet shrinks quite a bit, so it's no longer a significant policy issue. We will still have an operational framework. Uh, we will always have uh, one of our core uh, roles is to provide liquidity to banks, uh, and those banks in turn need to provide post-collateral to obtain that liquidity. So even under normal times, collateral policy uh, remains a, a very important uh, area in, in which uh, secondary objectives can maybe be taken into account. Uh, other elements of the, the operational framework include, include the marginal reserve requirement. And you may have noticed this summer, we, we changed remuneration uh, of the, mar the minimum reserve requirement. Um, uh, and I'm going to say that was a proportional decision. Uh, you can ask me later <laughs> uh, why that is. Uh, but let, let me also emphasize, going back to dimensions, the other big way I think we, we think about these issues is in relation to the interest rate policy, uh, we have a medium term perspective. So we, we don't say we're going to hit inflation 2% every day or every week. It's over the medium term. And that, that is a flexible concept how quickly we get to a medium term. We're very precise at the moment. We say we're going to hit 2% in a timely manner. So, so, so that level of precision um, uh, allows us, again, to take into account a, a range of considerations. And maybe the, the last thing I'll say, again, from my economic point of view, uh, 
Uh, one of the interesting uh, debates, and is also prominent at Jackson Hole uh, 10 days ago, it is um, uh, when, when we intervene, uh, when there's essentially the risk of financial instability, um, for example, in March 2020 or previous episodes, uh, or more recently with the Bank of England with the LDI intervention uh, last autumn, uh, what's interesting about that is, is it's a, essentially we can think about interventions which, you know, in principle can be designed to be essentially neutral on price stability, but which are, you know, quite important for, for a, a stabilising the financial system. Sometimes they go together, the same policy can both stabilise the financial system and contribute to price stability. Uh, but but uh, sometimes you can think of them maybe separately. So that's another uh, interesting uh, dimension. So with that, uh, um, I, I look forward to learning from my uh, from the panel members and from the ongoing discussion. Uh, and so let me uh, briefly uh, uh, welcome uh, Alexander Seal as, as the first uh, panel speaker. He's a professor at the law faculty of the BSP Business and Law School in Berlin uh, and regularly lectures on constitutional and European law. Uh, from his uh, uh, resume, he has quite a broad range in expertise, including books on the history of the modern state, an introduction to constitutional history, and a textbook on the general theory of the state. Uh, and uh, for, for your Christmas book list, an introduction to the German institution. Uh, German constitution is due to be published at the end of this year. So hopefully you'll make it there for the, uh, uh, for, for the Christmas list. Uh, so with that, over to you, Alex. Yes, uh, thank you, Philip, uh, very much for this kind uh, introduction. And I'm obviously tempted to talk about the German constitution now, but I won't. Um, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, what should the ECB do with its secondary mandate? Or rather, from a legal standpoint, what can the ECB do with its secondary mandate? And in the following, I would like to answer this last question by taking a closer look at the relationship between the secondary mandate and the independent status of the ECB. Now, I believe uh, that the question what the secondary mandate actually encompasses and what instruments it allows the ECB to implement cannot be answered without knowing how independent the ECB actually acts when it reverts to its secondary mandate. Now, to do so, I will start by briefly recalling, very briefly recalling, the general justification uh, for the independent status before looking at possible consequences for the secondary mandate. Now, the independent status uh, of central banks in general, and the ECB in particular, is, no, uh, is so uh, natural to most of us uh, that we sometimes forget that at least in a democratic order, uh, such a status needs some sort of justification. Uh, the idea of independence, of course, came up only in the middle of the 20th century uh, due to the central banks now broadly accepted general tasks, task of safeguarding price stability that can lead to possible conflicts of interests uh, if performed by a political institution. So, from a democratic perspective, we therefore find a justification for the independent status by specific task. In other words, and this is vital for our uh, general question, it is not central banks in general that need to enjoy an independent status, but only central banks equipped with the task of safeguarding price stability. Central banks are independent because and as far as they safeguard price stability. Now, what follows from this for the interpretation of the secondary mandate of the ECB? Well, if the independent status needs a task-related justification, can we find such a justification um, as concerns the secondary mandate? Are there good reasons, in other words, to assign the task of supporting the economic policies in the Union to an independent central bank? From a de democratic um, and especially a German democratic perspective, uh, the answer, unfortunately, is rather simple. No. Economic policy of any sort is nothing that requires independence from political authorities to be undertaken successfully. On the contrary, it is highly political and its controversial character, uh, character generally requires it to be vested in an institution that is directly accountable to the people. Of course, the ECB is only obliged to support the economic policies in the Union. That might lessen the problem, but clearly does not solve it. 
entirely. How and when to support what specific element of the wide range of economic policies within the Union will again be highly controversial from a political perspective. And as a consequence, therefore, but not as the final answer, the ECB lacks the required democratic legitimacy when it offensively reverts to its secondary mandate. However, as the secondary mandate, of course, is formally integrated into the treaties themselves, it can hardly be interpreted as in any case breaching the European democratic principle. Now, that leads us to two possible solutions. The first solution would be to interpret the secondary mandate as restrictively as possible. This could ensure the necessary acceptance of the measures taken, but unfortunately, would at the same time render the secondary mandate practically negligible. The ECB would be more or less hindered to actively revert to the secondary mandate at all. In terms of content, the mandate would thus be more or less limited to prohibiting the ECB from actively harming economic policies in the Union through its monetary measures. The ECB would thus have to implement possible economic consequences into its monetary policy, but would not be able to pursue any form of active economic policy, even if this were not accompanied by any risks to price stability. When the secondary mandate was formulated, at least some of the German participants might actually have had such a restrictive interpretation in mind, as the wording of the treaties was, and this might come uh, as a surprise, actually directly taken from the former German statute of the German Bundesbank. Having this history in mind, it comes as no surprise, therefore, that such a restrictive interpretation is the one the German constitutional court prefers. In its various decisions dealing with the ECB, it has always pointed out that the independent status requires a restrictive interpretation, not only of the secondary mandate, but even of the primary mandate. In other words, the German constitutional court has limited the secondary mandate to an absolute minimum and would stand in opposition to any interpretation that might allow the ECB to pursue any form of economic policies that might have an effect on the redistribution of wealth or even stricter, any economic agenda at all. Now, is that it for the secondary mandate? Well, let's look at another possible solution that might even convince the German Constitutional Court, or rather the Second Senate of the German Constitutional Court, ladies and gentlemen. We have the head of the First Senate here, of course, later on. Uh, instead of restricting the secondary mandate, one could also think of restricting the independent status. Now, the scope of the secondary mandate could then be widened as far as the independent status was restricted. The term independence would thus be interpreted differently according to which part of the mandate the ECB is making use of in the concrete situation. The ECB would enjoy a wider degree of independence when it reverts to its primary and a narrower degree when it reverts to its secondary mandate. From a dogmatic point of view, such a different interpretation may at first seem strange. After all, the same term and the same treaty articles are involved in each case. Nevertheless, there are good reasons for such a differentiation. First, as explained, there is a close link between independent status and specific mandate. Independence is no matter, of course, but a direct consequence of the primary mandate. And in this respect, it does not seem too far-fetched to generally interpret the term independence mandate related. This applies all the more since the concept of independence is by no means unambiguous in terms of content, but rather permits a whole range of different interpretations. Of course, the minimum requirements of, uh, in, in terms of content will also have to be observed in this respect. Direct instructions from other European authorities are therefore also prohibited with regard to the secondary mandate. However, it would certainly be possible to tie the ECB's actions more closely to the political institutions, not least the European legislator, and in fact the ECB seems to have increasingly sought this proximity in recent weeks. 
The greater the extent to which such a tie-back would be possible and actually succeed, the more the ECB would then be able to draw on its secondary mandate without having to fear the acceptance problems mentioned above. Now, how could such a stronger political tie-back of the ECB look like in detail? One of the central criticisms of the second mandate is undoubtedly its vague scope. In this respect, Article 127 refers comprehensively to the again very broad and open catalogue of objectives in Article 3 TEU. The ECB thus has, at least in theory, considerable scope of concretization and thus the possibility of pursuing an independent economic policy agenda. It is precisely here that the greatest concerns in terms of democratic theory are likely to arise. Now, one could thus think of limiting this goal independence by having the concretization and specification of the secondary mandate carried out by another body, namely the European legislator. In fact, the treaty contains comparatively few provisions for the legislature with regard to the independence of the ECB. Direct instructions of, to the ECB are out of question for the legislature anyway, and Article 282 merely obliges it to respect the independence of the ECB. Now, um, the ECB statute, of course, which specifies its monetary policy activities and the instruments to be used, should be considered first. However, since the statute is adopted as a protocol pursuant to Article 129 and is therefore primary law pursuant to Article 51 TEU, such an adjustment would require an amendment of the treaty and thus would be improbable and not really feasible in practice. Yes, Article 129.3 TFEU at least opens up the possibility of modifying um, at least certain provisions of the statute in the ordinary legislative procedure. However, these do not include the provisions on the concretization of the mandate. This brings us to Article 121.2 TFEU. According to this article, the Council, on a recommendation from the Commission, shall prepare a draft for the broad guidelines of the economic policies of the Member States and of the Union, and shall report thereon to the European Council, which on the basis of this report, shall discuss a conclusion on the broad guidelines of the economic policies of the Member States and of the Union. Subsequently, it is again the Council which, on the basis of this conclusion, it's a very interesting article, by the way, uh, adopts a recommendation setting out these broad guidelines. So far, these Council recommendations have, of course, refrained from any influence on the ECB's actions. And this was quite clear and uh, right in view of the primary mandate. Any influence in this area would not have been accepted by the ECB or the ECJ. Nevertheless, the situation is different for the secondary mandate. As just explained, within the framework of its secondary mandate, the ECB is active only in a supportive capacity, but nevertheless, obviously, in the field of the economic policy. The ECB activities, therefore, are necessarily at the same time a part of the economic policy in the Union as a whole, to which Article 121 explicitly refers. Neither does it differentiate between specific institutions, nor does it explicitly exclude the ACB as a possible addressee of the final recommendation. Turned differently, in its recommendation under Article 121, the Council might also define and specify the ECB's contribution to economic policy in the Union through its secondary mandate. In terms of content, this recommendation could, for instance, not only specify the secondary mandate, uh, example, the fight against the climate crisis as an objective to be pursued by the ECB as a matter of priority, but also specify the permissible instruments to which the ECB should have recourse in this context. Now, what consequences would such, such a concretization by the Council have for the ECB's actions? First, from this point on, the ECB would be able to refer to the Council's recommendation when reverting to its secondary mandate. Its actions in the area of combating the climate crisis would thereby acquire the necessary democratic legitimacy, especially since the Council's recommendation is based on conclusions also of the European Council, that is, the member state leaders. The political responsibility for the ECB's action would thus be assumed by the Council and the European Council, 
which both would have the possibility to adjust or modify the recommendation at any time if they were dissatisfied with the ECB's behavior in this regard. Moreover, since it is merely a recommendation that is not legally binding, the ECB could also deviate from it at any time. Two constellations need to be distinguished in this respect. First, the ECB would, of course, be obliged to deviate from it if and to the extent that such actions would be incompatible with its primary mandate. The recommendation does not change the hierarchy between primary and secondary mandate. Secondly, it would also be possible for the ECB, at least formally, to concretize the secondary mandate independently, thereby leaving the recommendation completely or partially aside. In this case, however, it would risk that the measures it takes would not have the necessary democratic legitimacy so that either the ECJ or, more probable, the Federal Constitutional Court would intervene. Overall, this would provide the ECB with the required democratic legitimacy to make effective use of its secondary mandate, but without risking the flexibility it needs to exercise its primary mandate. In other words, a win-win situation. Let me conclude. In order to make the secondary mandate work, we should differentiate between two scopes of independence. A strong independence when it comes to the primary and a weaker form when it comes to the secondary mandate. This would allow the political institutions to concretize the secondary mandate and thus the ECB to actively help in our common fight against climate change, uh, the scope of which Frank Elderson actually mentioned earlier this morning. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And no doubt many of the uh, points you raised will, will come back in, in the rest of this panel uh, and later on. So, so our, our second, second speaker is uh, Dr. Klaus Turi. So let me welcome uh, Klaus back to the ECB. Uh, he started his career in the Monetary Policy Division of the ECB and indeed at the EMI, EMI beforehand, if I'm correct. Uh, and of course, uh, he, he decided to upgrade from economics to law. Uh, with, 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 with an, yes. Uh, with, with an intermediate stage working in, in the private financial sector. So more recently, uh, he's been working on, on the EU economic constitutional model and economic constitutional law with, of course, a focus on the ECB uh, on money. Uh, and two of his uh, books include the Eurozone Crisis, a Constitutional Analysis, and also the European Central Bank and the European Macroeconomic Constitution, From Ensuring Stability to Fighting Crises which is, I think, a, a history book, uh, 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 as opposed to a forward-looking book, maybe. Uh, so uh, let's see. So over to you, Klaus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for, for Kira Tilioli and, and the ECB Legal Services. It's, uh, it's uh, very nice to be back here and, and also back in the, in the same room. I, I remember sitting back in, in that room because this is where the press, press conferences were held early on, and, and, and they're being very, very nervous about how the markets would react to whatever Wim Duesenberg had to say on a given situation. And I, I can, that was a, somehow a good reminder of, of that the basic business of monetary policy can be quite tricky and challenging, particularly when you start something very new. Uh, I was given a task to talk about uh, some parts of the ECB's uh, secondary mandate uh, and, and mostly about priorities and proportionality. Uh, here I have to say that I, I very much failed on, on most of the counts. The first count I fail uh, about the secondary mandate. I will discuss it a little bit uh, about the evolution of, 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 of the ECB's uh, mandate, the discussion about the evolution of ECB's mandate. Then I will discuss a little bit uh, about what could be the current state as we see it now, both from economic and, and constitutional uh, perspective with regard to defining the ECB's mandate. Uh, and then I, I will move, and also I think in the book I try to be forward-looking in, in, in many ways uh, uh, and also thinking about not being involved in, in crisis all the time, but rather rather uh, on, 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 on the key tasks. Uh, I will go to seeing where, where could we get some guidance on, on, uh, on how uh, the ECB's objectives and other aims could be defined in, uh, in, in a sustainable manner and also uh, some words about how that that uh, process should be controlled. Uh, 
I will have some slides just to remind, remind me of what I'm doing. And, and then this was the, which way do I? I'm still clearly a lawyer now that the technology is starting to get uh, behind me. So the evolution has, has reached it, its final stage. Uh, okay. Uh, so first about the evolution of the ECB's mandate and, and, and the reason I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about secondary mandate is, is that I'm, I, I don't really understand the concept as such. How it, to me, it doesn't really exist in, uh, in, in, in the legal literature, so it's, it's, it's a little bit, little bit tricky. But I think it's more easy to see how the evolution has gone and what are the drivers of, of the evolution. The first phase was, was where I was also myself involved was the time when, when it was really treaty interpretation. What, what did the member states confer when they conferred uh, central banking to the ECB, when they conferred monetary policy? What, what, what moved? Uh, and, and, and the ECB on the other side tried to define what it is doing. And then at the time, quite naturally, very strict view on monetary policy. It, it, it was mostly about, oh, very much about monetary policy. Uh, uh, it did discuss uh, the, the support of other economic policies, but mostly by saying that the best contribution is made by maintaining price stability. And th this was this was quite quite clear at the time. And then what is also in the in the objectives parts, particularly in the statute, uh, or also in the in the one twenty seven uh, the TFEU, is the accordance or supporting uh, the functioning of open economy and free market. And that was also discussed to some extent with regard to how the operational framework of the ECB and how it was supposed to uh, uh, tackle its monetary policy through banking sector, how that, that would be made in, in accordance with, uh, with free market. So these kind of issues were in the first stage. Then the next stage was the redefining the borders of common monetary policy. What do we mean by common monetary, monetary policy? And naturally, this was crisis-led expansion. And here is the time when we, we get the, the court coming in, somebody else giving, let's say, proper legal uh, views and, 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 and definitions on ECB's mandate. And this is, I think, one of the most problematic areas uh, I understand a lot what, what, what is being said, but I have to say that I don't think there's any central bank in the world except the ECB that is defined by price stability mandate. I think we have very different definitions, but you don't define by, by, by or one, one uh, single objective. It's, it's defined more, more broadly. And there could be good reasons, but I think this is the, 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 the problematic part that, that when it was defined in, 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 in such a way that monet, monetary policy is defined by, by, by the aim of, of price stability, then the whole discussion about conferral and all the issues became part of discussing monetary policy transmission. And if I put my old economist hat on, I know that in monetary policy transmission, anything goes in, in many ways. I mean, I, I think it's a genuine task of trying to get the task done, but it's a it's a very elusive concept for in, in legal interpretation. And, and, and this is where we get to the, uh, let's say, nasty business of proportionality, which, which I will discuss a little bit later. Then where we are now, I think it's, it's now not redefining the borders of common monetary policy, but more redefining the borders of the ECB. And this is where I, I think the, the concept of secondary mandate is, is really coming, coming to the fore. And, and I see two basic reasons for this. One is that, once the ECB has expanded so much because of the, as, 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 as Philip Lane mentioned, uh, the asset purchases and so on, going so far that it's, it's now it's roughly 50% of the European GDP or Euro area GDP, it reached something like 70% of the Euro area GDP. The central bank is everywhere. And it's not only ECB, of course, it's other central bank as well. But once you are in most of the areas, you are affecting a lot of the, lot of the areas. And there's also a lot of temptation how to use this being there for some other mostly good courses. So that's one side. And then the other side is that there were generally new societal needs. One is, is environment, as we know. It, has, it was not at the time when, when the treaty was made, it was not a major issue, uh, not, not in the scale. And I think it has, it has increased dramatically over the years. And then digitalization, which is another area which is affecting the mandate of the ECB in a way that, that we didn't see, for example, the, the digital uh, currency. I will speed up. So where are we now? So if, if we look at the very broad area, I think we should start, and this is where I think court maybe was a little bit lazy. They didn't start from the 
from the start by looking at what is there in the middle in the in the thing but what is the word in the middle down there it's central european central bank it's uh, that's the really i mean that's a it's a function something where you are central to the banking sector and 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 we have some concepts some ideas what is central by what central banking means and it's uh, i mean it has let's say 200 years of quite quite established history and then let's say 100 years of of even more more defined roles i mean objectives have changed over the time but the basic role in the economy and in the financial system have has remained quite stable in, in central banking so i think that could could have been maybe slightly better starting point and what it uh, what, what what where we still are clearly is that the ecb is the policy maker but in parentheses, only in monetary policy area. This is where the ECB is the one that calls the shots. This is what the, the key element what is what is conferred to the ECB is monetary policy. Uh, with regards to support of, of uh, general economic policies, I think the starting point was and, and still somehow is that it's the EU equivalent to the ECB paying attention to growth and employment. This was the starting point. The Fed's dual mandate was the part of the discussion, all this idea that 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 it doesn't ignore these other elements. And, and I, I think this is, to me, it, it still is a sort of non-isolation clause, uh, a sincere cooperation clause that you don't isolate. I mean, you are independent, but actually that independence should mean that you can engage in discussions and, and you can be active, you can be open. And I think this has quite often been the case, but it's, it's, uh, it's not, not necessarily more than that. Uh, what is still the case is that, as, as Philip Lane also mentioned, that monetary policy is mainly cyclical too. It affects in cyclical manners, so structural policies do not of, often fit particularly well. In some cases they can, but the basic underlying thing is cyclical policy. So that, that, that maybe should be uh, remembered. And then uh, finally uh, on, on where we are is that I think we, we still don't really understand what kind of societal force central banks and, and, and their balance sheets are. And, and, and how far reaching the direct and indirect effects are and how manifold they are. So this is the, the big issue, I think, of, I mean, it's a question of concentration of power, but I think to me, at least, it's even more concentration of risk. That if it's one party that is calling to shots, it's always, always a risk, even if it did the best of, of jobs. Uh, and I think what is good in, 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 the, in the strategy review of the ECB is that it has engaged in discussions concerning its, its, its role in the society and impact on society. So it's, it's acknowledged that this is a real issue and it's a real, real responsibility. Uh, so now going to actual topic, what are the other aims where we can go? And I would start from, from what is included in, in central banking. And this is the something that would give the evolving idea that, that, that we still derive tasks and aims uh, from, from the idea that, that we are the central bank of, of, the, of, the, of the area. We have to take care of banking sector liquidity, payment systems, uh, stability, these kind of issues. And then we are there to support general economic policies in, in, in many ways as central banks do. But central banking at the same time is also evolving concept. So uh, I don't think the ECB or the EU legal practice should define it itself, but should, to be a little bit open to, to, to discussion on how central banking is, 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 is evolving and, 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 and seeing it from there. Uh, environmental considerations, yes, I, I can see that that, that has special uh, reasons now how, why it's, it's, it's been raised. Uh, we all probably do. And I think the, the easy way of, of having, let's say, a little bit more leeway in that direction is, is the use of Article 11 TFEU as, as, as a real responsibility of, 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 of the ECB to engage in, 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 in its own action to, to include environmental considerations, particularly climate change, uh, in, seriously in, inside the, 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 the framework. Uh, but then we have to remember that it's support, but not responsibility for general economic policies. And I think this is particularly difficult field because when, when we go to distributional value discussions, we are easily in, in a very, very difficult area because we can, we can, we can discuss various programs, how they affect, but I think we have uh, William Butcher in, in his, his quite recent book had calculated, and I'm now using a reference to an old program, so nobody here has been responsible, but for the first lot, Lotro program, where the ECB gave three-year money to banks, that that was maybe subsidy of some 90, million, 90 billion to, to banks. And I think 
it, it makes sense to program, but we are talking about, I mean, and this is very respected economist, William Butcher is not doing it to, to shock, but it's just basically making the fact that when you are doing dealing with this kind of amounts of money, you, you are affecting the society, and that's part of being central banking. But then to open, uh, open the whole discussion about distributional and value discussions, I think that will be very, very difficult task to, 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 to handle. Uh, and then the additional part, what, what I think is, is that what we have to be quite careful is, is not to tie hands off of monetary policy going forward. Uh, I will conclude with some ideas how to guide and, and maybe delimit the ECB and how, how, I mean, because of course we can trust them, but as we know, uh, control is better, as, as uh, some old, old Russian said some time ago. Uh, uh, and I think here, my starting point would be that the, now the legal discussion, I'm not particularly fond of, and I'm not particularly trustworthy that the legal part will be the control mechanism or delimiting uh, mechanism. And I think now the key problem, as I mentioned, is that the, the defining central banking and the ECB through price stability objective alone, and then using proportionality argumentation is, is, is not particularly helpful. And it's not particularly fruitful in, in, in many ways. And also what it has meant is that the whole uh, issue is now about monetary policy transmission mechanism, which is not, it's not particularly uh, fruitful for, for legal discussion. And also it's not particularly fruitful for public discussion involving public to understand what the central bank is doing. So basically still the control, main control to me uh, would be still the proper giving of justification, care and reason and transparency. And this both to the public and, and to EU Parliament. There, I would say that for the Parliament, I would ask them to maybe up their game a little bit, to be slightly more demanding on justifications. I think this is more on their side than, than, than the ECB side. Uh, and then finally, I would say that the main accountability, we didn't discuss accountability because we were not supposed to, but still the main accountability issue is to the people of the Euro area, that, that the job is to give give them a currency that holds its purchasing power. And, and basically, if you fail in that area, there, there's all these other mandates and aims are, are, are becoming quite quite small in, in comparison. And I think even, even uh, let's say, providing for, for in, environmental uh, climate change, I think you, you most definitely need to maintain anchor price stability, even, I would say, even better than now in order to allow for longer term investments that it, it requires. So failing that area, the other areas, you would do a lot less for, for environmental protection. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, and the, the third speaker on the panel, you can see on, on screen, is Anne Cargan, who's Deputy Head of Legal within the Legal Directorate at the Bank of England. And she has particular responsibility for advice on climate and environmental matters. She's also been involved with the Legal Ec Experts Group uh, of the uh, Network for Greening the Financial System and uh, has arranged a cross-organisational cl climate summit of UK regulators and central government de departments on the legal aspects of the UK's climate agenda for financial services. So with that, uh, let me hand over to, to Anne. So good afternoon, Anne, uh, on screen. Good afternoon. Um, well, I'm going to pick up some of the themes that uh, other presenters have, um, have laid out here, and we'll focus on the climate aspects uh, that the bank's involved in and the structures that um, are supported by those. The climate subject, subject matter of this panel is an issue that we're all grappling with globally. Where is the dividing line, for instance, between public policy, monetary policy, and the regulatory remit? And how do we manage issues where the secondary competition objectives or support of economic policy might conflict with actions to mitigate climate risks? Uh, next slide, slide please. Thank you. Um, these are all huge questions and they are front and centre of the minds of the people that we serve and the firms we regulate, our parliamentarians and our governments. There are strongly held views that go both ways, that competitiveness is key or that preparation for the inevitabilities of transition to net zero is paramount. In the UK, the financial services reform agenda 
has influenced, has been influenced by this debate. And as you can see from the slide, there have been many concerns raised in Parliament here due, during the passage of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2023. Uh, next, next slide, please. Oh, back again. Thank you. Uh, the Bank of England has an overarching objective to protect and enhance the financial system of the United Kingdom. And that is implemented through its four primary functions, monetary policy, macroprudential financial stability, microprudential regulation of the, the firms it regulates, and microprudential reg regulation of financial market infrastructure. For each function, the primary objectives are paramount. We find that climate risk from the direct effects of climate change and transition either flows directly into the climate objectives or will have the capacity to do so as the globe moves through transition to net zero. This year, Jay Powell uh, of the Fed, Christine Lagarde of the ECB and Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England have all commented on the approach of their respective institutions as regards climate change. It is striking that although the, separate, the statutory frameworks of these great central banks are different, all three leaders have drawn out similar themes, independence, democratic mandate, and managing the financial risks of climate change. At the Symposium of, on Central Bank Independence in Stockholm in January, Jay Powell perceived that in order to maintain broad support for its mission within a democratic society, the Fed must remain independent, but also that it should stick to its mandate. He considered that to adopt new goals without such statutory underpin would undermine the case for independence. Where climate change interacts with its functions, Jay Powell considered that the Fed had a narrow but important responsibility to require that banks understand and appropriately manage their material risks, including the financial risks of climate change. Christine Lagarde at the Summit for the New Global Finance Impact in June reiterated that it was for governments to lead the fight against climate change and to honour their commitments to transition. She highlighted that central banks must, within their mandates, support the greening of the financial system. And for the ECB, Christine Lagarde highlighted that climate change is a priority because it affects inflation, affects the central bank balance sheet, and because it is a financial risk for the bank supervised. Most recently in June, before the Treasury Select Committee, Andrew Bailey reiterated that the Bank of England must stay focused on its primary objectives and view everything else through that lens. He underlined that climate change is a risk to financial stability and prudential regulation because firms are holding long-term assets that can be at risk from climate transition and in the future, climate change could have an effect on the evolution of the economy. Though he considered that in the bank's view, it was not an issue in current policy setting within the MPC. So the Bank of England takes account of climate change within the exercise of all its functions. But the context is always managing financial stability. And Andrew Bailey was clear, and I quote, the bank is not there to make climate change policy. That is other people's job, not ours. Uh, next slide, please. Turning now to the substructure that supplements the operation of the primary objectives, the bank has a complex statutory framework of secondary objectives and other matters to which it must have regard when making decisions. Understandably, the government's policy imperative in creating this, st this structure is that the actions of the bank in exercise of its functions have a wide effect on on the economy and economic actors. So we should be taking such matters into account when making our decisions to pursue our primary objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Well, what climate actions have we taken and how do these fit within our statutory framework? You can see here a list of the main areas of development since 2019, and along with our colleagues in other central banks, this represents a huge step change in how we conceive of, regulate and integrate climate change within our functions and our operations. As previously mentioned, 
The bank's focus is to take action in pursuit of its functions and primary objectives, first and foremost. But in addition, in our own operations, we have applied the same rigour to ourselves as we expect of others. And we have taken action with the aim of providing exemplars to catalyse action within other firms. The bank's transition plan, most recently, which includes our notes manufacture, is a good example of this discipline. Another example is the MPC. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and as part of our functions of, of a central bank, we undertake market operations to ensure changes to interest rates are transmitted through the system. The corporate bond purchase scheme is a monetary tool, monetary policy tool. For as long as the MPC maintained its target for CPBS holdings, the bank undertook periodic reinvestment operations to replenish the scheme as bonds matured. One such operation took place in late 19. The next, in November 21, was the first to incorporate a new greening methodology. As Andrew Bailey said at the time, our strategy in greening the CPBS is to help incentivize firms to put in place and adhere to credible plans for redu reducing their emissions. Incentivizing change is more powerful than immediate divestment to encourage the significant shifts in behavior required across the economy in order to achieve net zero by 2050. We hope that by being transparent, our approach will encourage and enable other investors to further develop strategies to green their portfolios. So you see here themes of proportionality and actions to support and catalyze change in action. In terms of the legal structure, you'll recall that the MPC's primary objective is price stability. In 2021, price stability could be delivered through the purchase of corporate bonds without consideration of green factors. In this instance, the secondary objective to support the economic policy of the government and the expression of that policy by the Treasury in its remit letters assisted in expanding the scope of actions available to the bank and enabled it to develop a methodology and issue a market notice in relation to the purchase of corporate bonds. Since 2021, as Phillips alluded to, uh, monetary policy has changed its focus and the scheme is in the process of being unwound. The bank has sold the green portion at higher prices, reflecting the premium awarded to such bonds in the market. Uh, next slide, please. The FPC uh, identifies and monitors risks that threaten the resilience of the United, United Kingdom financial system as a whole. As you will recall, its primary objective is protecting and enhancing uh, financial stability. Its secondary objective is to support the economic policy of the government, and at least once a year, the Chancellor makes recommendations about the FPC's responsibilities for financial stability and also about the government's growth and employment objectives. These are set out in a remit letter, um, which has reinforced the relevance and importance of climate change. We are now at a point in the transition to net zero where the direct effect and transitional effects of climate change are a part of the FPC's business as usual assessment of known macroeconomic risks. Um, as part of our functions as a central bank, we understand. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. Hang on a second. With the PRA, the FPC undertook a climate biannual scenario stress test on certain PRA authorised firms in order first to test their resilience and second to identify firms' reactions and the potential for inadvertent consequences of those actions on the macroprudential stability of the United Kingdom. 
This has led to updated supervisory expectations to firms by the PRA and for the FPC, monitoring climate change as business as usual, as a business as usual exercise regarding known macro prudential risks. How far and fast to move is always conditioned by proportionality, taking into account such factors as the potential for inadvertent macro effects, the impact of supervisory guidance on firms' own safety and soundness and, uh, and their business. As all central banks are finding, there is a fine balancing act. This is not a static situation and proportionate actions will change in nature over time as the globe moves through the transition to net zero. In 2022, the climate stress test scenario um, the primary and secondary objectives of the FPC have aligned internally and with the primary and secondary objectives of the and regulatory principles of the PRA. Turning to the PRA, next slide please. The actions of the PRA from 90, 2019, as noted in the slides above, have so far generally run directly through the primary objectives. The Financial Services and Markets Act 2023 introduced a new net zero and environmental regulatory principle. The net zero principle is um, in force, the environment is not yet in force. The regulatory principles engage on a decision level basis and relate to the making of rules and policy. They do not override the primary objectives and sit in a hierarchy below the secondary objectives of competition and competitiveness Yet they do operate with the other regulatory principles, such as proportionality, as applicable to the circumstances of the case to influence policy decisions. And last slide. Oh, last slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the formulation of the new regulatory principle refers to the need to contribute towards achieving compliance by the Secretary of State of the net zero targets, where the regulator considers the exercise of its functions to be relevant to the making of such a contribution. I have included this whole quote from Baroness Penn, who is the per permanent parliamentary secretary to the Treasury, because it, it takes my talk full circle Baroness Penn's comments in Parliament are a recognition by the government that the regulator's role in the transition to net zero is a supportive one within the context of their functions and within the statutory hierarchy of objectives, secondary objectives and other matters to which they must have regard. As such, her comments can be seen as, as a part of the continuum from Jay Powell and Christine Lagarde through to Andrew Bailey uh, and re reinforcing the distinction between the democratic mandate of government to um, enact uh, actions to, to take countries through the transition to net zero and the supporting role of uh, the central banks in all their functions. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm mindful because Anne has a has an important uh, uh, event later on this evening. So, so I, I want to, to let her go early. So in order to let her go early, what I want to know is, is collect any questions or comments you have uh, from the floor uh, that would be directed to Anne and then 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 she'll have have uh, uh, been able to respond to you. So, so over here, there's a Um, it's it's on. Okay, thank you. It's not directly to an. Uh, it's directly to all panel. Um, so, uh, sorry, Claudia Swart, Claudia Swart. Uh, my question is whether it still makes sense to talk about primary and secondary mandate when we uh, con talk about post inflation and we consider that fifty percent of the access assets in the bank balance sheet of the banks are. Uh, connected or highly influenced by biodiversity and uh, ecosystem service. If this distinction still makes sense, that's that was my question. And it's for the whole panel. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so, thank you, and we, we will come to it uh, in general, but, but and I'll let Anne also uh, address that, but let me just collect, uh, again, if you have comments or questions for Anne, so in the, in the front row here. Um, thank you. Um, David from Carlos III University. Um, so what, what um, appeared um, or struck me from from uh, the presentations is that, um, or, or at least a comment that I, I also want to, to introduce is that uh, rather than um, whether to support climate policies or not is, is part of the secondary mandate, is, is whether there is a legal argument to support them over other objectives. Because if one looks at guidelines from governments, they are very long wish lists because governments don't like to leave anything out. So in the end, it is the central bank that chooses which policies of those uh, can it support according to its mandate, which leads me to the framing. That, that's probably why central banks tend to frame climate change in terms of the primary mandate. Uh, because it is the of those government policies it is the one that has a very clear uh, implication for the primary mandate of monetary stability or or price stability but here comes the the interesting thing even though this impact should be something scientific or uh, unobjectionable at least this is what science increasingly tells us the emphasis that central banks make on on the impact and the importance for the primary mandate varies depending on how politically controversial the issue is uh, in their own jurisdiction so although the things are common the emphasis that the federal reserve makes is different from the one that the ecb uh, makes depending on how politically controversial the issue is so in other words, uh, is the whole debate about secondary mandates a, a little bit of a sideshow uh, from the real issue? Again, no doubt we'll come to it, but let me just again pause and see if there are comments or questions in relation to, to uh, Anne's contribution. Well, I'm going to ask Anne something. So, so Anne, uh, and again, kind of uh, reading across, because it's very helpful to have this comparative uh, perspective and of course we could also do it with many other central banks around the world who also have to uh, deal with these issues but my, my question to you is in terms of uh, explaining well is it a, an issue and if it is an issue how does the Bank of England try to explain the, purport, the proportionality of its decisions whether it's to the Treasury Select Committee in its publications uh, or in other fora so so it, it well, you tell me if there is a kind of a kind of a, a fixed approach to, to articulating proportionality of decision making. Okay. Feel, feel Thank free you to very much. The, the, the other questions as well uh, that came up. Thank you. I'll take I'll take the second question first in terms of it, support to climate over other objective uh, other objectives. Um, I think, and also your point about the way in which different uh, central banks refer um, to their mandates and their actions in terms of the political climate of each country. I think that's inevitably going to be the case um, because you have to live in the society that you're, you're serving. Um, but in terms of supporting climate over other objectives, I think that is dependent on the particular circumstances of the time. So at the moment, you might have a situation where Andrew Bailey has said that monetary policy, he's not seeing um, environmental matters, for example, coming into uh, or climate uh, into the uh, operation of monetary policy tools at this stage of the transition but that we are in a continuum and you don't know how that will look in five or ten years time so in that sense i i, I don't think it is a matter of um, preferring a particular objective or a particular subject matter over over another i think it's a, a, an understanding of where you are in the circumstances of the time and how that affects your functions and then how that feeds through your primary objective and then subject to that your secondary objectives 
And in terms of proportionality of decisions, how we do we describe that? Again, I, uh, I think that is a um, and that is driven by a particular case. Uh, so you saw in the CPBS um, Andrew Bailey's comments about uh, a preference for assisting and providing the um, circumstances for firms themselves to transition. And that is a much better way of behaving than withdrawing from markets. And you see the same comments from the FPC um, from the, the most recent uh, stress test. Um, and, and the comments that feeds in then to the comments of the uh, PRA in terms of the uh, um, updated supervisory uh, expectations, where you're you're not simply saying yes, go ahead, undertake your business plan and withdraw. You're saying undertake your business plan, but make sure that you are supporting your customers through transition themselves, and and that is in itself uh, an expression of proportionality um, in terms of impact uh, that policies might have. Um, and then the last one in terms of primary and secondary mandates, where ecosystems are concerned, ecosystems and um, the impact of environment on financial services and financial stability especially is probably um, a, a less developed uh, area than the impact of climate change, a pure climate, climate change without ecosystems um, on um, uh, the primary and secondary mandates. So I think that one is, uh, I think that is up for grabs, but essentially I would say that the same principles apply, that you look through your primary objectives, you look through subject to that, your secondary objectives and see what effects, because because the central banks and the, and the UK central bank in its in its different functions is a supporting mechanism. It's not a it's not a policy generating mechanism. And you look at what the effects are of um, destruction of habitats on on financial stability, and you deal with that um, as and when necessary. Um, oh, sorry, please. Kiara. I just have a small question for Anne before she disappears. Um, no, I was just curious, maybe I did not understand, but you, you did a very, very good presentation, very exhaustive. And of course, uh, Bank of England is different from us in the uh, scope uh, and, and importance that it gives to financial stability. Uh, yeah, it's broader, it's more um, monetary uh, stability is also there. You mentioned both, and I would be um, grateful for an explanation when you come to the secondary objective or the environmental uh, contribution. Uh, I had understood that falls mainly under financial stability or does it also falls under monetary? Can you explain that, please? So uh, in terms of sort of factual, I think it depends on the factual nexus at any particular given point in time. So at the moment, it's the FPC that's taking the lead here in terms of um, whether or not uh, degradation of habitats, for example, have an effect on um, financial stability. Uh, okay, so it's at, at, depending on the depending on the concrete situation, it could be either financial stability or monetary stability, so price stability. Yes, it depends. It depends. At the moment, it's, uh, it certainly doesn't seem to be monetary stability. It's, uh, it's being looked at by the FPC. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I've just lost you. <laughs> I think you can still see me. I, I've lost you at the moment. Uh, um, maybe that's a good, good timing. To, uh, thank you again for your contribution uh, and best of luck this evening. Okay, so, so let me. Um... Thank you. Then let me t turn to the uh, other two panels and the, the questions I had connect a little bit to the questions from the floor. 
Uh, Klaus in his presentation mentioned that essentially there probably was a long-standing history of viewing the secondary mandate as essentially something akin to the dual mandate of the Fed, which is all else equal, um, you should pay attention to, to growth and employment. And this connects very much with our medium-term uh, perspective on, on price stability. But uh, I think that that's kind of folk wisdom a little bit. You know, so, so when we do have that dimension, maybe not very well articulated, when we do have the environmental dimension, how do we pick, or whatever else you want to put in there, how do you uh, prioritize? So, so that's one question. Uh, second question is, I think, coming up to, to something Alexander uh, emphasized, which is basically, is there indeed uh, way, ways to kind of think of independence differently with respect to the secondary mandate compared to the, to the first? And again, for us, uh, when we look at the Bank of England, uh, when they receive an indemnity, there's an ex ante agreement with the Treasury about who bear, bears the, the financial risk in relation to asset purchasing. Um, and the Fed has something similar as well, whereas uh, that, that, that was something that didn't happen or does not happen w with us. Uh, and, and then the third, uh, in a, which is a bit heroic, is essentially saying, well, because uh, as was mentioned, uh, we definitely think of uh, a lot of the, the climate change, and by the way, the biodiversity issues as well. Uh, you know, it, it's I think straightforward enough to think about them under the primary mandate. But let's imagine uh, we didn't want to fully rely on that. Uh, is there a way we, we should be using the secondary mandate as well? And just by the way, for advertising, uh, the, the Bundesbank in June had a very good conference, basically about biodiversity and monetary policy. And if you uh, you can look at this slide, they're all at the slides and presentations on the website, but it's a very good, uh, uh, interesting way to think about it. So, so maybe, Klaus, if you have any reactions to what these questions or what you heard so far. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> there were quite a few, so I am uh, I'm trying, uh, struggling to figure out which one to go for, but I, I think they were overlapping as, as well to some extent. And I think one of the, the key issues is, is and I, it relates to the, I mean, also the question of distinction between uh, primary and secondary mandate. And I think it, that's somehow makes the, 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 the broader case in, in, in the sense that I think it, it makes sense because it is the way of, of, of uh, distributing responsibilities between member states, but also between different policymakers. And it doesn't exclude the idea that particularly if the, the, as, as, as you mentioned, that in, in the fields where your your main task as, as a central bank is directly linked to issues where you can improve and, and, and make your case or make make your contribution to 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 uh, climate change and, and biodiversity and and, and 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 so on, I think obviously you should do it. But I, I still still think that those priorities are, are there in, in in a treaty, and you can't change them just because you feel like something else is is important. I, I think this is, uh, and it doesn't take value away from 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 these other other objectives. Uh, but I think the more generally, the, the one of the key issues is is I, I think when when we think about these these issues is I mean actually two related things. One is that. I think that the issues mainly arise when there's a conflict between first and second. It's easy to talk about. Whenever they, they come with the same thing, you can, of course, contribute to whatever in the world, all the nice things if, if you contribute to good things. And I think th in this sense, we are now in a, in a slightly different situation when, when you have actually have to have restrictive monetary policy. You are not only delivering good things to the world, you are actually uh, providing longer term future, I mean, and, and for that uh, shorter term sacrifice. And then it's, it becomes more clear what, what are the who's who's benefiting and, and, and who's losing because not it's not a question of who's benefiting most from from the action but rather 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 something different and then as, as I mentioned I, I I think there if, if you prioritize environmental issues for example even as I mean I, I, I'm, I I'm, I'm first to admit that their importance but I think you would do bad thing for the environmental issue because I think the idea that the ECB would solve the problem I think that, that that's why for example Bank of England Fed has been very clear it's not because they don't care about environment or sustainability I think they are clever clever uh, responsible people of course they are scared of the whole thing as, as, as we all are but they know that they shouldn't give anybody an impression that they take care of it 
that in the political circumstances, it's the politicians, because it's the nasty things you have to give to people. There's a lot of cost to pay. There's a huge amount of investment. There's a lot of things we have to change. And when you change, you have to change the relative prices in, in, in the economy. You have to make, make uh, uh, carbon uh, negative or, or biodiversity negative actions more or, or less desirable than, than some other actions. And, and this is for politicians. I don't think it's for the ECB. You can do something with the, with the balance sheet. Fine, I think in, 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 the, in, in that respect it, it, it makes sense, but I don't think it will solve the problem because, I mean, the market will then, as, as, as we know, even if, if, if you prioritize something in, in your own balance sheet, then the markets will, I mean, they are still most, mostly interested in, in risk and reward, right? I mean, not, not, so you are not, you, you are not telling the market what, what the pricing will be and where they will invest it, just who will invest in, in, in what products rather. So not to exaggerate your own role. Uh, so in, in the prior uh, priorities, I think there, I think the first question you have to ask is, is, is what, what is my role in, in the whole thing? When it's clear that your, it, it stems from, from uh, price stability or it, it, it's clear that you have a big role and then the, the, this gives all the areas that are close to link to it, give you a major uh, mandate or uh, force to prioritize. Then I, I wouldn't regard, uh, disregard uh, Article 11 in, in, in a way that it can, I think, it be used a lot more because it's, it's quite clear and I think it, it just, uh, it, it will become even more, more forceful uh, in, in, in the coming years and, and, and when it's been, when it's been Im implemented. But I, I think there, and I, this was one of my, my key ideas, is, is that you should also maybe I mean, particularly if you look at the ECB, look around what the central, I mean, you can look around, you can learn. I think this is why, why, why Homo sapiens was, was, was better than, than Homo neanderthalis or, or what was because we learned from others. They had bigger brains, but they didn't learn from others, but we can, we can learn from others. So I think you can, you can be in, 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 in the game of, of learning and then thinking that you are the central bank, not the price stability institute, but the central bank of, of, of Europe and, and, and what, what, what is, is then, uh, in, in, implied from that, what uh, and independence. I think this is the uh, this is too difficult for me. The understanding how 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 do you because the same. I, I think there's the, 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 the there's this. It's it's like soap. I mean, if, if you if you say that you have different levels of independence and accountability for different measures, I think we basically affect the way the measures are labeled rather than, I think it's still one accountability for the institution and, and somehow, I mean, I, I, I think it's a heroic idea and I, I, I would support if, if you can make it, make it happen, but I'm not sure that, that, that with, with, the, with the instruments, because I think there are actually less instruments than, than are actually implied very often. I think to me, uh, the central bank is, is, it derives most of its power from the creation of, of money or create some central bank money. And then it has different implications, different ways that it, it, it manifests itself, but it's still the same power. So you use it one way or the other when, when, when you are active in the marketplace. So I, I think, yeah, I, I stop there. Thank you. Alexander? Yes, thank you very much. And um, after this, this very controversial first panel, I'm, I'm happy to say that we at least disagree a little, Klaus. That's fantastic. Yeah. So first of all, does it make sense to um, talk about a second and a second, a first and a secondary or primary and a secondary mandate? Uh, from a legal perspective, of course, the answer is yes. I mean, it's in the treaties. I mean, we, we, we've got to work with the treaties, right? So what, what can we do? But I see the point, of course, that, that we have to sort of rethink what actually follows from the fact that, the, that we don't look at the economy anymore as being neutral. It's not neutral to us. It, it does matter what kind of assets we purchase suddenly, right? because we somehow believe that certain assets are bad, to be quite honest, and others are better or good or green or whatever. So, so we have to sort of see and, and what, what actually follows from that for a differentiation that is in the treaties that was established when we didn't know anything about climate change. We didn't think about climate change at the time. And we never would have thought of a central bank being responsible for the transition to net zero. I mean, that was something nobody would ever have thought of at the time. So, so that brings me to the question, what we are actually fundamentally doing with this conference and generally what we are doing in central banking at the moment, I would say. We have seen a fundamental change um, how, how the ECB is perceived, of course, right? Um, by the political sphere and especially by society. Monetary policy used to be regarded as being too complicated, too technical too boring, to be quite honest, to be actually discussed in, in, in public. 
it was seen and regarded as somewhat as being unpolitical. Now, that was never true, of course. It was always, of course, also a political institution, the ECB. But this perception has definitely changed since the financial crisis, where the ECB, and especially the public, actually became aware for the first time, maybe even, of how, how powerful central banking actually is or can be. So we now have a sort of new institution in the, on the political sphere. And this is not a sort of very small, uh, neglectable, neglectable institution, but it's a powerful institution. It's a really powerful institution that obviously can do a lot of good, probably also a lot of bad things. So I would say finding that the ECB is such a powerful institution, first of all, is a good thing. Now, what we are doing right now is that we have to find a way how to use this power for the common good. And that is, of course, a common good beyond the price stability target. So that's what actually is happening at the moment in central banks. And I think that's a good discussion we should, we should have. And I do sincerely believe that the European Central Bank, we, I, it would be a, a mistake sort of to leave that power just somewhere on the road and say, well, we have this transition to net zero we have to face, and we have to, we have to, we have to succeed with. But we just leave one of the most powerful institutions aside and say, well, ah, it's too complicated. So I, I disagree. I would say, of course, it was no task for a central bank 20 years ago. But why not use this power if we can find a way to use the power for the transition process to go to net zero? And therefore, what we see with this different approach that we see with central banks, they're trying to do that already differently. Why are they trying to do it differently? Because it's political, as you said. It depends on the political surrounding, obviously, how central banks can act in this sphere. And if it's political, then we need some sort of participation, then we need some sort of legitimacy. And I would say that that is something that the ECB should focus on when it, when it thinks about using its power. And then, it, indeed, it doesn't really matter is it the primary mandate or is it the secondary mandate. If it's, if it's, sort of, if it's, if it's actually allowed well, by the public, by the democratic, um, by the people, as we said in the first panel, then, then I would say it's okay. But at the moment, we're seeing a situation where, where the central banks are trying to sort of put it into the primary mandate and trying to say, well, it's nothing, nothing has changed. It's the primary mandate. We're sort of just looking at it differently. We're putting climate change in there. Yeah, but in actual fact, it's price stability and so on. But no one really believes that, seriously. It's obviously something different. And if it's something different, then we need to find ways to make this approach feasible from a democratic perspective and that's the debate we're having at the moment i would say and why not try something new why not try something for instance like different degrees of independence when it comes to prime and secondary mandate in order to do so very, very good so i'm going to collect uh, a, a number of questions um uh, and I'm going to try and be reasonably balanced across the different sections of the room. So I, I was looking in this direction, so I'm going to start over here. Uh, so, so let me say, there's a gentleman in, in a grey suit uh, here. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here. Uh, thanks for, who said, oh, no? Thank you very much, Fabian Amtenbrink, Erasmus uh, University of Rotterdam. Uh, the, 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 the later the afternoon, the, the vaster some of the claims that are being uh, made, uh, so it's, it's, it seems to me, but, but uh, super interesting. Uh, definitely, Alexander, I, I congratulate you on just, you know, going for it. I think, and I'm, I, no, I, I think you're making a very important point from a legal perspective, and that is, assigning redistributional tasks to independent agencies is a constitutional abnormality, okay? So for, for a lawyer, there is no principle, there is no natural law according to which that should be assigned to independent agencies, okay? So, and this is why your point you're making about task-related independence or autonomy, we could discuss that, is so important. And indeed, uh, if we say the theoretical and empirical uh, case has been made for central bank independence when it comes to price stability mandates, where is that empirical evidence when it comes to other tasks, whether it is climate mitigation, whether it's fighting in economic inequality and the like. And this is not saying 
it is not there maybe, but where is it? And I ask this as a lawyer to economists or political economists to, to come up with it. Now, coming to your idea, lovely. Um, my question to you is um, how democratically legitimate do you think the European semester is? Uh, and uh, the way in which broad economic policy guidelines uh, are uh, formulated in there, because it seems to me that a lot rides in your model rides on that. Uh, and the other uh, question is uh, where in in that model comes in then this 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 distinction that we still have this asymmetry that we have in EMU where we have centralized monetary policy, but in principle, at least on paper, economic policy stays with the member states. So where, where is then there a, a, a limit? I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Daphne Ploegsa from the Dutch Central Bank. I have a question also for Professor Alexander Thiele. Um, so I was quite interested by your proposition on how to solve the issue of the vagueness of the scope of the secondary mandate and your proposition to solve this through council recommendations. Um, and my question is, uh, why did you choose the council as a, a body, considering the fact that if you want to solve the issue of democratic legitimacy, we also have a European Parliament, which is directly elected by the European people, um, who could play this role. And maybe also taking into account the fact that if you look at the recent resolutions of the European Parliament on the annual reports of the ECB, it's actually talking about which issues the Parliament thinks the ECB should focus on when uh, talking about the secondary mandate. And it does not only include climate or environment. Thank you. We're going to move to the middle section and more or less the same uh, role. Uh, if you put your hand up again, please. Hi, thank you. Anna Pecha from EUI. Um, to Professor Thiele, um, two very quick um, remark question. Um, your scheme for independence on a gradient works in an ideal theoretical division between economic and monetary, right? Okay, we could agree on that. Moving on, if you follow through with your scheme and imagine that this is put in place, what happens when certain tasks are called up, such as we discussed earlier, environmental policy that could go either way under the primary mandate or the secondary mandate. And then you have legal challenges from, I don't know, Karlsruhe mostly, um, that, that tell the ECB, look, this is not your primary mandate, this is your secondary mandate. You don't have that much independence. I, I mean, you're opening a can of worms a bit. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and just to your right there, yeah, please. Alexander Pugai, the next um, critical comment. I am matching the following scenario. The European Council issues a recommendation to the European Central Bank saying the European Central Bank should focus its balance sheet policy on green bonds issued by the member states. And the member states need these green bonds in order to fund uh, climate adaptation measures increase in Italy, wherever in the European Union. Do you see a conflict with the operational independence of the central bank? Do you see a conflict with the prohibition of monetary financing under Article 123? I'm asking this question because in the end, we're not simply talking about concepts. Automatically, we must take into consideration the limited number of instruments the European Central Bank possesses. And in the end, Policy is only interested in a few instruments, and they are really risky for the independence of the European Central Bank. Garrett, you wanted to add something? Yeah, yeah okay. Two brief remarks and then one question. Brief remarks. First, um, you mentioned that when the, the Maastricht Treaty was uh, drafted, there was no idea of climate change, yes, but internalization of cost was there. And here is exactly what we're talking about now in calculating, looking into things, um, tilting. This is what we're talking about. Second point. Um, 
on your independent different level. This is something that uh, the German Constitutional Court has put in a footnote of the SSM judgment. Yeah, it's a very German uh, statement. <laughs> Now, uh, the doctrine uh, is divided, whether for the civilist an institution for which the treaty says it is independent for its uh, activities, its functions, its tasks, you can make this differentiation. Practically, it would be complicated. Intellectually, of course, you can make your argument. But for me, this problem does not exist for uh, the secondary objective, because the secondary objective says the ECB supports someone else. So when you support, you are not independent in the same way because you need to rely on the policy makers and follow what they do. You are independent in deciding whether or not you take action, which will be dependent from whether or not this is contradicting the primary objective. But I would say, rather than talking about different types of independence and the need for the democratic intrusion there, it is the necessity that the ECB has because it supports to look into the direction that the Policymakers in recommendation could be one, but there could be other things. And then I would have a question. I don't know if uh, there is still time for that, but what do you think about proportionality? Is there a different requirement for the demonstration of proportionality when you do the secondary objective? Um, some people argue that. I'm not convinced, but I would like to hear your views. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Chiara just mentioned, it says support. Um, I would like to add, it says shell. There is a legal obligation to do something under the secondary objective, be shell support. Um, now, in many of our utterances, in many of my own speeches, I've said we are not climate policy makers. We are climate policy takers. Um, Many of these speeches I've, I've shared with our colleagues in the Fed, and I would say, and I asked them, do you agree with this? And they say, yeah, we are exactly on the same line. We are not climate policy makers, we are climate policy takers. I said it with so much emphasis because many times we find ourselves um, defending against straw men. I'm not saying that this was done this, this afternoon, but I'm just saying more generally, straw man arguments that somehow we are um, um, making policies in terms of policy. We are not doing that. But it does say under the secondary objective, we shall support. Now, one more, one more thought going back to the climate litigation speech I gave. Um, there has been already um, a central bank of the European system of central bank that has been sued for not doing enough. The debate for the last two, three decades has always been, aren't they overstepping their mandate? I'm not saying that that is not a relevant question. It's a very relevant question. We think about it every single day. But I'm only submitting that we start to think much deeper about the other side of the coin. And that is, are we doing enough? Are we not under delivering under our mandate? Also our secondary objective. And um, um, that that is something that, and, and then I will stop. Um, I, I made the argument here that there is no longer the luxury that we can avoid um, um, to at least think about what it could be if judges find that corporates, that states, that banks, but also that supervising central banks are already today under the positive obligation to do our fair share. This was found in the Urgenda case. It was found in first instance against the Shell case. It has not yet been found against the bank. It has not yet been found against the supervisor. But I don't think that we can now exclude at least that risk that that might be the case. Now, if you then try to, to tie these things together, and it might be that we are being found that we also have to do our fair share. If you read that we shall support, if you make sure that we never overstep our um, um, our mandate, uh, then that question of are we doing enough, I think is a very poignant one and a very urgent one. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And uh, we're already a little bit over time. So I, I, I noticed that if people want to ask questions, be, you can uh, buttonhole the speakers uh, during the coffee break. So Alexander, uh, if you can just, don't try and be comprehensive, just just try and uh, uh, pick and choose what, what you respond to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Philip. Yes. Um, 
Well, let me let me start by simply sort of trying to to address one more time what I'm actually trying to do. Uh, the first thing the first thing we all can agree to is that we fa are facing a fantastically horrendous challenge when it comes to the, the climate change. Second, we have a very powerful institution that might contribute to this to this overcoming this challenge. I'm talking of the ECB. Right? So, so the the question I'm asking is how can we bring these two together? Because um, the fight against climate change is something probably we all can agree on in this room. But when we look at the society, it's, it's controversial. I'm coming from Germany, where we had a debate on a, a radiator law uh, that, was, that was crazy. So we see this is highly political, how to, how to challenge or how to, how, to, how, to, how to go about this challenge of, of climate change is highly political. So what I was trying to do was, I was trying to find a way to use the power the ECB might have, but still ensure the necessary acceptance of its actions taken by the public. Because it's, it's no use having a sort of a central bank then dealing with these questions and using all its credibility and then in the end not even being able to uh, uh, succeed in its, in its primary mandate, for instance. So we need to find some sort of institutional arrangement that makes it possible to do that. And I do sincerely believe that we will only manage to do that if and as far as the ECB has the necessary democratic legitimacy that, that is required to, to do such a, um, to, to, to take action in such a very uh, highly political um, uh, field. So yes, indeed, um, in an ideal world now, I would sort of construct such an institutional arrangement. But I have to work with the treaties. And that brings me to your question concerning Parliament. There's simply no provision that actually would allow the Parliament sort of to do that directly. And Article 121.6, uh, uh, sorry, 121.3 uh, is sort of a provision that at least gives the Council such an opportunity. I have to work with the treaty. So that's, that's the reason. I would love the Parliament to have the power to do that. Uh, but there's no article in the treaty to do that. So, and we're not going to amend the treaties in time. So we have to work with the treaties. Um, on the other hand, I found that the that in the end it's a recommendation, quite quite a good solution because indeed the European Central Bank can deviate. Christoph, uh, we, it, it's not bound by the recommendation. So if there is such a um, problem with 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 the primary mandate, it could deviate from the from the recommendation. But that's only sort of the idea. It's no it's no a binding. Uh, a recommendation. It's something where the European Central Bank could say, no, that's not feasible uh, due to our primary mandate, for instance. Um, so is this the ideal solution? I would say no. Uh, is this a solution? Maybe. And uh, answering Frank, has the ECP so far underdelivered? Yes. I'm pretty sure from a legal perspective, ignoring the secondary mandate, as the ECP has practically done for the last 20 years, is something that clearly under delivers from a legal perspective. So making the um, secondary mandate somehow work is, uh, is something we need to do as, as lawyers. And finally, Chiara, yes, indeed, we need to support and we don't need different independence uh, uh, levels or degrees, you say, but already deciding to support what kind of economic policy is a political decision that can be very controversial. Why is it only climate change? I mean, the Article 3 includes everything and you're picking climate change now because because everybody's talking about climate change but tomorrow you could pick something else uh frank you're a policy taker you say but what 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 policies are you actually going to take and that's a political decision and i would like sort of some political institution telling me that you can take that very good uh uh klaus do you want to stand please okay so let me uh in closing, uh, I think it's quite an interesting, interesting session, but I, I do want to push back against a couple of things. Uh, absolutely, uh, climate change uh, and more generally transit is absolutely front and centre for our primary mandate. I mean, I live this uh, every six weeks on a monetary policy cycle. What the hell are we going to do about X, Y and Z weather shock around the world? How is that going to affect our projections for inflation and GDP and so on? But, but let me connect to something that Anne Carkin said as well. This, so one level is that it's, it's already there in, in, in the monetary policy cycle. But second, and this connects both the climate change issue and financial stability, price stability is, is and you actually said earlier on, 
uh, it's mostly cyclical, it's not structural. I won't have a yes, but, but the, there are these kind of tail, risk, uh, tail risks facing the European uh, 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 economy. Uh, and uh, prevention um, or kind of guarding against tail risk goes a long way. And if you go back to 2008 uh, and all that happened after 2008 and say, oh my, why, you know, uh, some prevention in the decade before that could have gone a long way. I think uh, prevention now in terms of the, the climate risk can go a long way. And, you know, uh, there's a, in the world of economics, there's an interesting uh, hypothesis. Uh, people who work for central banks, financial regulators, uh, most of your pay should be 50 years from now. Deferred pay, which can be yanked if you don't do your job. Because the horizon, you know, we can omit a lot of things now or do a lot of things now, which have, like, consequences uh, for, for decades. And then I want to push back, because uh, Alexander uh, seemed to indicate a while ago that boring was a negative value. <laughs> it's the, the highest compliment uh, you, you can pay at the central bank to say that's quite boring. <laughs> that, that's what we like. So, so the, uh, I would say we want to restore that to where it should be. So with that, uh, it looks like there's now like an 18-minute uh, coffee break before the keynote. So thank you.